The following content is provided under a Creative Commons license. Your support will help MIT OpenCourseWare continue to offer high-quality educational resources for free. To make a donation or to view additional materials from hundreds of MIT courses, visit MIT OpenCourseWare at ocw.mit.edu. The founding of Gentile. Um, yeah, so a little bit about these two people first. Uh, so we, have, we have Herbert Boyer, who was born in 1936. Um, he was a biochemist from Pennsylvania, um, and originally from Pennsylvania, and then worked at University of California in San Francisco. Um, and he's kind of, sort of considered one of the first pioneers in the field of molecular genetics. Um, and we also have Robert Swanson, who was born in 1947 and died in 1999. Um, he was from Brooklyn, went to MIT, and then eventually got into venture capital. Um, and he was instrumental in founding the uh, founding Genetech and kind of developing the financing structure for that. So there's a list of some other players that were involved. Um, they kind of came in throughout the process of various talents that were recruited both nationally and internationally. Um, Boyer worked with Arthur Riggs and um, Keiji Itakura from the Beckman Research Institute, and the group had become the first to successfully express a human gene in bacteria when they um, produced uh, when they produced somatostatin in 1977. Um, and then David Godel and Dennis Clyde as well were brought on later on in 1978, I believe. Um, yeah, and they were they went on to be instrumental figures in the company as well. So I'll go into a little bit about what they, what they accomplished, just sort of the early history of the company. Um, they really were the first kind of kickstart of the American biotech industry. And um, you know, it all started when the two of them kind of met, uh, Boyer and Swanson met over beer and laid down $500 to um, start this pharmaceutical company that would explore proteins that bacteria could be engineered to make. And they first targeted um, human they first targeted human insulin uh, because you know, that was kind of a competitive area at the time, and there was a lot of demand um, for treatments, but there was a worry that there wasn't enough an supply of animal insulin to meet this rising demand. So um, they kind of decided on working to make synthetic insulin up to scratch and be competitive with um, what was previously used. And they targeted meeting the requirements of Eli Lilly, um, who they kind of wanted to get his business to um, they, they targeted his requirements they could get his business eventually and get the company going. So getting money was kind of a tough process for the, you know, throughout the entire time. Um, they both really staked a lot of their career um, on this endeavor, and Swanson at the time was very young and went through many periods of unemployment as he was trying to, you know, get the money for financing this. Um, and Boyer continued his, his day job teaching. Um, so eventually, um, so the, they ran into many obstacles financially, but they also, at, at the time when they decided to kind of target human insulin in the first place, that kind of kick-started a, a nationwide um, race to do this. And so there was a group at Harvard and another group at some, another university in California, um, I'm blanking on the name, but yeah, they, it was a, they were particularly formidable rivals and they had, um, those other two groups were kind of entrenched in academia and they had all the resources that that brought them, um, whereas Boyer and Swanson were relatively resource poor. Um, but they had one advantage. Um, he was work Boyer was working with synthetic DNA, which would allow him to get around regulations that the NIH put on natural DNA um, during this process. So uh, they faced a lot of other obstacles, and but they still had advantages. Other teams still had advantages of scale and sales ability. Um, Swanson's goal was to make Genentech a fully integrated uh, pharmaceutical company, and they wanted to, the eventual goal was to be able to produce and sell a wide range of drugs. Um, and they believed that if they were the first to make the insulin, that would be able that would give them the lift up in the industry that they needed. Um, so Swanson went on a hiring spree and recruited talent. They were able to vote, uh, open up their own lab. Eventually, he was able to get 100k from various sources for that initial push. Um, so eventually, by uh, August of 1978, they were able to make their first 20 nanograms of the insulin. And they immediately contacted Eli Lilly, and Swanson kind of went against convention and had his huge televised press conference where he announced 
um, that, that, that they had achieved what they wanted to achieve, and that kind of did what it, he attended, and put Genentech really put it on the map and in the public eye. Um, and eventually, you know, um, Eli Lay's company came forward with $10 million for Genentech, and, and they were eventually able to fast track it for industrial production. Um, and in 1980, they had their IPO, and it was one of the most spectacular IPOs seen from this industry. Um, and they were eventually able to, uh, in 1985, they were able to release a second drug, and these are some of the early products of um, the company. Um, yeah, so going on to the types of um, qualities of great groups that we've been talking about. So I think one of the main things was Swanson's leadership. So the article mentioned that he had a very down-to-earth style and was well co connected with everyone who was involved, um, as well as a great generosity towards everybody. And so he, was, he offered basically everyone from the top scientists to the custodians a share of the company um, at one point. And you know, he had a really great um, effective recruitment of talent. He was able to see where they needed people and how they could fill out those positions. Um, another really important, uh, another important element is that there was a real conviction of cause. So Boyer initially wanted to get into commercialization because he um, felt that university research and government-funded research wouldn't allow him to see the real benefits, practical benefits of his work. So it was kind of a really altruistic goal of his. Um, and. They, that mission kind of carried them out, carried them throughout this process, um, that they were going to be making something that would better people's lives, save lives. Um, another important element is that they were working against a common enemy. So it wasn't exactly an enemy, but they were there were those other teams that they were working against, and that competition really fueled them. And going along with that, they were kind of like the underdogs and the young company that didn't have the resources and didn't have the funding. So that really was another motivating factor as well. Um, yeah, another one is optimism and a degree of naivete. Uh, so that kind of came into play when they first made the insulin, but Eli Lilly said that they needed, had put really strict um, uh, timeline on them for developing it for industrial production. And most people would have said that that was impossible and that they couldn't do that in that time frame. But they were none the wiser and kind of went for it anyways, and it ended up working out, working out for them. Um, another thing is that the people were not interchangeable. So, like I said before, they were they were that list of players that I showed you were very instrumental and in their very specific expertise that they brought to the project. Um, also, that there was there was relative freedom for a lot of the scientists involved in Genentech. So, one of the things that Swanson did to get people on board, especially um, David Godel, um, he said that they could still have the freedom to publish under their own name, even though they were contracted to Genentech. So that was a real incentive for people to join them. Um, and lastly, there was a really casual environment in the office, teacher attire, and you know th there wasn't a, any, you know, strict rules or a sense of top-down uh, management. So um, some other dynamics that I think are important. Um, this was an interesting case of a great group because it came at a time when there was kind of a change in relationship between science and business and academia and the commercial sector. Um, and Boyer's journey was pretty interesting. He started out firmly in academia, but he chose to look beyond that. Um, his words, like I said, his words at the initial meeting with Swanson um, about wanting to see the real practical benefits of his work kind of carried the, carried the whole team throughout. Um, but you know, the flip side of that was that in the early history of Genentech, he was a target for academic scientists who dismissed the idea that corporate <coughs> science would ever be able to achieve the kind of things that they would be able to achieve. Um, and his move to commercialization really drew the animosity of academia, because he was one of the first of many scientists at the frontier of molecular biology who, were, who sought to capitalize on the commercial opportunities. Um, and one of Swanson's and Boyer's, to some extent, strength was their ability to recognize the exact moment in, ba um, in, the, in basic research in molecular biotechnology that was most um, beneficial to open, up to, to open it up to a commercial endeavor. So they were able to combine an, an extensive knowledge of the science what they were trying to do and also the business acumen needed to move it forward. 
Um, and this really set them apart from other big drug, drug companies at the time, um, and I think ultimately con contributed to their great success as well. Um, yeah, so this is a quote about Swanson, who is really kind of one of the first figures who was able to s really bridge that, that partnership between um, science and business. So in a way, you can kind of think of him as like an advocate for the scientists that he was representing and the people at Genentech who were looking to really advance in this field that was quite new. So um, I guess one of, going on to sort of discussion questions, one of my main questions was, did the relative newness of this field and this industry really help them? I mean, did that offer opportunities to Swanson and Warrior that may be more established industry or field would not have and did that allow so them? I'm going to put that on hold for just a second mm -hmm. just throw a couple of kind of framing points out but if that's I think that's a key question and I'll lead up to that Sanem this is the first biotech right this creates the model and you know as you point out this combination of Boyer and Swanson is a fascinating combination because they are, as you put it, able to kind of bridge this divide between business and science. And that is the inherent, you know, brilliance of the biotech model. And these folks really figure out how to do it. And Genentech to this day is an extremely successful company. So it has been able to keep on that innovation pathway, which means that the culture that they set up here has been able to keep, you know, innovation um, occurring on a kind of ongoing basis. Um, and some of the points you made, and I'm just to emphasize some of the points you made. The fact that Boyer and Swanson allowed their researchers to do their own publishing, right? That they didn't treat what they were working on as a complete trade secret. That was a huge enabler in enabling the academic community to kind of enter into these biotechs. In other words, their academic role was going to be respected. Their role as researchers and scientists and contributing to general knowledge was going to get respected here. And that created a rule in this biotech that you know, prevails to this, to this day. And it, um, it very much influenced the kind of model. But the ability. So in the biotech model, and Swenson and, Swenson and, and, and Boyer pioneer this, um, they create this revolving door capability. So in other words, scientists at universities now in the United States that work in, in life science areas and related areas are able to have careers where they're in the academy, they move to a biotech, you know, as a scientist for a period of time, they can move back to the academy, right, taking their advances with them. In other words, they can move between these sectors. So there was, in European science, an historical upstairs, downstairs treatment, right? The academic scientists thought they were in curiosity-driven basic research and should have nothing to do with the kind of ugliness and kind of downstairs of commercialization of products, and that these worlds ought to be kept separate. And biotech is the first really serious attempt in the, in the academy in America to kind of bridge these worlds effectively, and they do brilliantly. And part of it is, as you point out, you know, Swanson is a chemistry major at MIT, so he is not afraid of science, just as you suggested. He understands what it is. He has, he has the ability to be in the room with these academic scientists and be in the game. But he also comes to this with early venture capital experience. So he first goes to work on Sand Hill Road, you know, out, outside, uh, outside, in Silicon Valley, outside Stanford. And they're only interested in doing IT. They have no idea about this biotech stuff. So he has to leave this major vent early venture capital firm that he's with and essentially starve, you know, eat hot dogs for months at a time as he tries to figure out how is he going to work in this biotech area. <coughs> and famously, he, as Sanam suggested, famously he starts cold calling. He has this idea um, that bioengineering is going to be this incredibly creative new field. He's aware of it from his own training. 
So he starts cold calling scientists that are working in this bioengineering field. He only has to get to the bees, right, to Boyer. And then they have this famous meeting at Churchill's pub where they actually so much hit it off, exactly as Sinan described. Boyer is concerned that if he just stays in the academy, nothing he works on is ever going to get out, right? And he wants to get his stuff out. He truly believes this. This is not, like, this, he is not out to get rich here. He is really out to get, to save people and get the technology out the door. Um, so in, there's a statue in front of Genentech to this day that pictures Boyer and Swanson sitting at the bar, each putting the $100 down on the table as they toast each other with beers. Um, that, that's what you see when you drive in and see the company headquarters in, at Genentech. And that's symbolic, I think, of what's happening here. These folks figure out how to make a really workable marriage between business and science that's you know, remarkably productive on both sides of the world. Boyer is totally ostracized for doing this, right? Um, he faces tremendous recrimination at UCSF uh, for having gone this commercial route. And it's only when they come up with these stunning successes that the scientific community really has to rethink the kind of way that it went after him. Um, so this was not easy for either of these players, but it's a really, it's a fascinating moment in a way creates a culture that to this day kind of still dominates that whole sector. That's a fair Summary. Now, let's come back to your great question. Why don't you just pose it again quickly, Sanam, and we'll do it. Um, yeah, do you want to say something? Oh, yeah. um, actually, I, I had a curiosity question. I was wondering, well, uh, was there, you had mentioned the, uh, the ability to publish under their own name. Uh, was there anything else that might have uh, spurred their success, or that might have uh, spurred the success of this marriage, as you put it, between academia and business? Well, that's recruitment tool. In other words, if you leave academic research, you know, university labs, and come to work for Genentech, you don't have to abandon your academic career. You can still keep doing your research work and building your research reputation while you're working at a company. And that's what that enabled. So it enabled academic researchers to feel that they weren't leaving the universe that they had, that had nurtured them. They could continue doing terrific academic work as well as practical work in this kind of company setting. And that was very reassuring and it was a great, it was a great, it, it broke down a whole divide between the worlds because previously in, in, in pharmaceutical companies, everything was secret, right? Everything was treated as a trade secret. So there was no outside discussion allowed until patents occurred. This really changed that culture. But Sunam, restate your question, because it was a very good one. Let's go back to it. Yeah, so my question was, um, do you think that the, the fact that this field, and the field, this field was so new and so starting you know, a very few years before that um, really helped them or afforded them certain opportunities that they might not have been able to have in a more established, entrenched field or industry? I'd say absolutely. Because there was no previous infrastructure, there was no establishment to fight. There was just the scientific challenge, and then trying to commercialize it. Uh, of course, I mean there were other there were other companies that were trying to do these things, but because it wasn't as established as I don't know coal uh, or the railroad industry or something like that, uh, it it's I think it certainly made things a lot easier. It, the market was a lot more fluid, and uh, they had a lot more areas to expand into. I think not only that, sorry, there is also a lot more room for error, especially as they're getting started initially. They're able to like experiment, um, they have more leeway in the way they can market and present their product because there is no established market. Um, I was wondering if someone could share maybe what they thought the regulatory challenges that they didn't face were. I mean, I think it was mentioned that they pretty much use the ability to use synthetic DNA in order to get over a lot of regulations. Um, also, it's relatively early. Nowadays, it's a lot harder. I think like uh, the price point to make a drug is over a billion. Um, back then, I really don't know what it was, so it really was a great opportunity. Also, their investors were Kleiner Perkins. Uh, also, one of them was in uh, Perkins. Which is the that Swanson had originally worked for and then had to leave because they didn't want to do biotech, but he went back to them with this advance and they 
you know, uh, gave them some money. I'm pretty sure they were in different spaces that were difficult, that would, they would have helped, but the investors were adequate in that space. What about Chris? Do you have any thoughts on the regulatory challenge? Yeah, so definitely using synthetic kind of um, molecules in an approach definitely helps because you can surpass that whole like clinical challenge, which not only is like hard to pass, but also takes a long time, right? And especially they were mentioning there's a real time crunch. Um, a lot of groups were doing this um, this kind of approach and research in this field, um, they really had to be the first ones out there so they could establish themselves as the leader and the real innovators in kind of this new biotech field. So I think their approach was smart. Right. I mean, this is a moment where there's a deep concern that comes up from the public, but also in the academic community itself about the implications of this genetic engineering, right? I mean, that's what Genentech stands for, genetic engineering, right? That's what they're all about. And there's a major effort to put this whole movement on pause, right? And there is an outcry in the city council at, at, in Cambridge here, you know, a wild hearing by the city council trying to shut down related research at Harvard and MIT because they're very worried about the implications of what's going to be happening here. So then there's an effort by the scientific community in this famous conference called Similar out in California where the whole community comes together and kind of really begins to work through the ethics. But their principal competitor, Wally Gilbert at Harvard, is forced because of this limit on genetic engineering and the ability to use genetic DNA. He has to go to England where they're still allowing that research and enlist a whole group of British scientists to undertake his research. But Swanson and Boyer get around that by using synthetic DNA and they avoid the whole outcry. So it's a very interesting development. It slowed down their competitors you know, pretty considerably. And Wally Gilbert was a great talent to be up against. I mean, a famous scientific leader and researcher. I didn't do this reading or know that much about the genetic backgrounds at all, but were the pharmaceutical companies at all their competitors, or were they very much so focused on just chemical stuff? Right. I think Boyer really came, you saw that drawing with the pseudo, that's a bacterial plasma. Let's go, let's go back to this and then that original and picture. And you insert yeah. your synthetic gene into it. There it is. That yeah. rectangle, like he basically came up with, that wasn't in existence okay. before, and now it's used every day in almost every molecular biology lab, yeah. So I don't think that the pharmaceuticals were onto this. Okay. Yeah, looking at that, you can try and guess which one went to the Sloan School, right? Yeah. Boyer almost never looked that good, let me tell yeah. you. <laughs> yeah, I mean, also, Swanson was uh, chemistry editor at MIT and then Sloan Masters. Right. He was like pseudo Sloan and after Right. <laughs> How about another good question, Sanem? Um, so something that uh, some of you who had read this kind of raised and I was curious about as well was um, so at the initial years because it was so new and because they were doing something that hadn't been done before there was an increased amount of risk taking that was needed and uh, you know they both really staked their careers on it especially Swanson who ended up having to check himself into the hospital when they had setback um, so I wonder if there's kind of a way to encourage more sustainable risk taking um, in people who have the visions like Swanson and people who, you know, people who are, who are starting up um, endeavors like this. If there's, if there's a way to like, make it that they are incentivized to take these risks that are necessary to further their careers, but also maybe not to the point that Swanson did. Um, at this point, I've led three innovation groups where I teach sort of people, not just students, but people, um, the engineering design cycle. And I think one of my big takeaways, you know, having taught students as young as five years old to, you know, individuals as old as like 
in their 50s, maybe 60s, um, is that there really needs to be a sense of safety and security, which was something that was brought up, I think, in the Biederman reading, um, which is, I think, one of the reasons why there's that sort of big paradigm of founding a company out of your dorm room, because there's something that's implied there, which is that you have a place to live, and that if you, you know, attend an institution where you have a dorm, you also have access to food, and you're also not super concerned about getting a paycheck. And so I think that sense of security, sort of both mentally to sort of take a step back and explore your dreams, is really important into the sense of stability. Like literally access to shelter, access to food, access to health care becomes really important. Um, so in those circumstances, I feel like universities and not just maybe in their undergraduate programs, but maybe universities generally provide really interesting opportunities to innovate for these kinds of, you know, very disruptive innovations because they do provide that sort of holistic support to an individual. Uh, but that's still a theory that I'm working under and, you know, sort of hope to continue exploring over maybe a master's thesis or a PhD. Um, but I think the other really big point about mental health is something that was also addressed in the Biederman reading, and it goes back to that sense of safety and security that a lot of times um, <clears throat> individuals who don't feel comfortable in their sort of organic or natural ecosystem feel more stressed, and thus that prevents them from being productive. And so I think about that in the context of the current political situation and the ways in which maybe some people who might be interested in innovating or pursuing innovative projects may not be able to do so effectively because of the ways in which the political situation is you know, literally motivating stress in their lives and is preventing them from innovating. So those are some thoughts. I have a lot of them. I want to share those too. I mean, on the other side of that, I think like this, the aspect of having stress, like a necessary stress is important. Like I think with the uh, Manhattan Project, like there's no safety and security and thinking the Germans are going to get involved first. And I mean, I couldn't think of a better impetus than, you know, this has to work or I don't have a house to live in or food to eat. <laughs> well, uh, actually, eh, that's actually not what they had to deal with at all. I mean, like, granted, yeah, they would say, like, yeah, oh, we don't have any lives, but, so I kind of agree, but, uh, I mean, Oppenheimer did mention in that paper, like, he went six months and he didn't even realize he had a paycheck. He, had, he hadn't received one. And uh, I saw that, and I just thought that was such privilege. <laughs> so uh, the fact that someone could um, have that uh, that sense of okay, well, if this uh, ignoring the implications of obviously failing on this project outside of the uh, Manhattan Project, any other uh, technological pursuit, I think that definitely uh, helps someone cre think more creatively when you don't have to think about oh, uh, how am I going to pay for my car or how am I going to get to work or whatever. So one of the important rules, I think, here is that the group needs to be on a protected island. Yeah. And the, the point you're adding, Steph, I think is a significant one. It needs to feel secure in itself, right? People have to be comfortable in this group to be willing to be creative together and contribute to each other. I think that's an important perception here that probably applies to a lot of these groups. Okay. But to do with that book, uh, Scarcity? Why having too little means so much. You don't have your full bandwidth if you're worried about... Mm -hmm. Um, what you don't have and what you need to work on. So, and that's part of creativity. So, Nam, did this group have that sense of security? I think, I think they, from what I read here, they definitely did. I mean, a lot of them were. And you don't see in this picture the whole team. There's a whole team here yeah, there's that's a very team. collaborative with these with this duo. Yeah, and I think that that was an interesting point about. Um, I did kind of get a sense that like class can, came into this in a way that. Um, you know, really benefited. You know, Boyer had this, he went into commercializing because he had an altruistic vision, which is interesting. But he also, you know, he had that uh, ability to not have to worry about making money and things like that. So I think that's a really interesting point that you all have raised. Um, and yeah, what you're saying about how people who feel like they are actively under threat or they actively don't have, you know, the basic necessity, um, necessities taken care of would not be able to function maybe in the way that, you know, make those innovations that... Right, they're on an island, they're not starving on the yeah. island. Yeah, exactly. I think an addendum that would be, um, have any of you read When Breath Becomes Air? A book by Paul Kalanick. You, it, um, he was a neuroscientist who was a resident, I believe, at Stanford, um, or sorry, neuroscience, neurosurgeon, 
uh, who is a medical resident at Stanford, who is just about to complete his neuroscience residency, and he was diagnosed with brain cancer, um, and you know ended up passing away, just shy of you know completing his residency. But there is a really incredible portion in his memoir where he talks about what he had to do in order to be able to achieve what he did, which is essentially after going to Stanford undergrad, he spent a year essentially being homeless, living in an abandoned home and taking classes at Stanford while studying for the MCAT. And I think there's a really, uh, the reason I recommend everyone read this book if they're interested in sort of becoming innovators or entrepreneurs or, you know, people who change the world, um, is that he elicits a really great point about not, not necessarily just quote unquote male privilege, but just privilege generally, because he was able to sort of opt out of being alive and utilize whatever money his parents were sending him or whatever money he had saved up in order to take these classes, in order to study for the MCAT, and then go on you know, to do incredible work in medical school and then in residency. And I feel like that's as sort of close as you get and the clearest sort of articulation of the process of giving up your whole life in order to pursue this big dream that you have. And so Paul Kalanick's book, I think, is a really, really great study, not just of a great group, but of a great individual and a person who's sort of a risk taker and willing to give up their life for their work. And then ultimately, obviously, you know, the conclusion of it is, you know, quite beautiful and, you know, right. the narrative arc is there. But and these folks are giving up, you know, to medicine out to pursue the dream. So we're looking at the winners, though. <laughs> well, we're I, only looking at the winners, yeah. right? I, mean, I, don't, <laughs> I would say that pretty much every biotech entrepreneur ends up with ulcers and high blood pressure. That's just they, they do. And but, or is it every entrepreneur? <laughs> no, probably. She only said biotech. You're saying. <laughs> I know. I'm more familiar with the biotech side, but I think that because. These, I think that's also a characteristic of the great group leaders, that they're able to take risks and get ulcers so that the rest of their team can feel the insulation and, and as though they have the opportunity for success, uh, resources, and security. So I think that's an aspect of this. Yeah, I agree. There is some. Uh, there is a quote in the um, paper that was that they the scientists at Genentech had no boss other than uh, Swanson's nervous vigilance. So that really like carried them. Through, sure. <laughs> That's a great line, Sam. Yeah. That's good. All right, let's do Venter, Lily. Okay. So I'm going over the Craig Venter great group today. A few of you have heard of him. Uh, most have not. The leader of the great group, of course, was Craig Venter. Um, and just going through some of the Benison Biederman uh, necessities of great groupness, or greatness in a group, uh, his mission from God was to sequence and decode the human genome. So check, we have a mission from God. The island, in this particular case study, uh, while they were decoding, <laughs> sequencing and decoding the human genome, their island was uh, Solera, which was a, a biotech that was it's complicated. I'm going to try to keep it as simple as possible for the purposes of this presentation. Just know that Craig Venter had like <laughs> many, many for-profits and non-for-profit institutions all running at the same time. He has not, he now has now more than he even used to. So I'm just really going to talk about Solera for the purposes of this presentation. Um, and then the mainland, he has connections with the public. He, there's a lot of publicity going on for, uh, at this time over the Human Genome Project, so that's sort of their their highway to the, the public or the mainland. Um, and he has contacts still at the NIH and adversaries at the NIH as well. And they are indeed the underdog. Craig Venter's great group defect from the NIH, and uh, they're up against funding from the US government and actually international co um, collaboration, especially with uh, the British government. And the so enemy. I, I think it's actually Watson rather than Crick, right? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. Right. Okay. <laughs> it is Watson. <laughs> I put the wrong one in there. No, Francis Crick had nothing to do with this, it was Watson. <laughs> Um, and, and Watson was heading the genome project at NIH at the time. Yeah, that yeah. drives Venter out. And so, and and Venter and and Watson begin as a very powerful duo, and Venter thinks that the genome needs to be sequenced in a slightly different way, and 
uh, Watson is not okay with that because so much money and so much effort has been put into it the sort of outdated way. Uh, and he completely undermines Venter in front of US Congress, et cetera. And I'll get into that a little more. But yeah, basically, the enemy is anyone who pisses off Venter, which turns out to be quite a lot of people over the years. Um, Venter, Craig Venter, I think, is one of the more, uh, one of the most controversial scientists in biotech in our time. He's a very, um, a little bit of a hothead. And he, pe people in, in science either love him or hate him. Uh, so a little bit of background, his early life. He's sort of, he's reminiscent for me of uh, Thomas Edison. He has some severe learning issues, almost flunks out of high school, does not go to college. He ends up a surfer bum in Southern California uh, on Redondo Beach. Now I want to add one fact. Not just one parent, but both his parents were Marine sergeants. Yep. So he's you can only imagine what that does to you. From this <laughs> militant household and decides that as soon as he's, I think he's like 17 when he graduates from high school, he decides, I'm getting out of here. I'm going to live in Redondo Beach in a surf shack and grow my hair out long and wear cutoffs. So that was his, I think, uh, rebellion against his parents. Um, this is during the time of Vietnam. Uh, Venter realizes, he comes from a military family, first of all, so I think he has a somewhat a sense of duty, but he also realizes that he's probably going to get drafted and it's better for him if he joins the Navy voluntarily. He's actually a, an extremely good competitive swimmer, possibly Olympic quality. So he joins the Navy thinking that he's going to uh, be on the swim team and not actually see active duty. And this turns out to be couldn't be farther from the truth. Uh, we, Vietnam ramps up, and he is uh, trained as an EMT and deployed to Da Nang. And he actually has two active deployments in Vietnam, um, sees, sees some things that I think change his life forever. In the interview, he talks about how uh, he's the person he is because of his time in Vietnam. Um, he survives and attends community college in California, uh, transfers to UCSD, which is University of California, San Diego, uh, gets a BS and then a PhD um, there. I think he completed his PhD in three years. It was the fastest, at that time, it was the fastest um, biochem PhD in, in UCSD history. He goes immediately to a faculty position at Buffalo in New York. Uh, interesting <laughs> transition for him. Yeah, there's, that's part of the, uh, the interview. He talks about how he's this Californian with long hair and then goes to, goes to Buffalo, where he begins to make people angry, actually. So I think he starts young <laughs> on his path. So he marries his PhD student, Claire Fraser. He's very clear that they get married after she graduates, so there's nothing wrong with that at all. And uh, in 1984, he leaves Buffalo, um, pretty much so that she can uh, start her, prove herself as her own scientist at the NIH. And I think this is where the, the great group really starts to coalesce and um, starts to, to form. Um, so the sequence of events. At the NIH, so while at the NIH, Venter is traditionally trained as a neuroscientist working in receptors. So is Claire Fraser. They have separate labs at the NIH, but something that Venter gets really interested in is molecular biology. He sees that it's this field that's going to explode, is extremely important, and is basically our path to future medicine. So he starts to, tr to try to get funding um, to do molecular biology experiments and get into this field by the machines necessary. And he's totally stonewalled at the NIH. He's basically told, no, you're a neuroscientist. You can't work in this other stovepipe at the NIH. That's just not done. It won't work. So he becomes increasingly and increasingly frustrated with the, with the bureaucracy, basically. And he says that he looks around and he sees people who are lifers at the NIH who just go through the motions of being a scientist who couldn't really compete uh, in the academic or the, the outside world. Um, so he does something a little maverick. He 
creates this, he, he's reading about and hearing about the Human Genome Project because it's a big initiative at NIH. And he decides, well, if they're not going to let me get into molecular bi biology and, and sequencing the human genome, then I'm going to sneak in by basically sequencing a gene involved in, um, in, in neurobiology. So he does that, and he invents this thing called EST. I'm not going to get into it. Honestly, it's such an outdated thing that I didn't even learn about it during my, during my studies. Um, and then Watson and Venter have, have met. So Watson is running the Human, human Genome Project at NIH. Right. Venter comes up, he, he has the sequence of this gene, he, he's made some pretty cool breakthroughs and goes in and meets with Watson, and Watson gets excited about it at first. But then Craig, Venter, goes off and kind of um, procures a machine sort of behind Watson's back, is what Watson thinks, and makes Watson really mad. So he totally undermines and vilifies Venter in front of Congress and the U.S. public, because this is a huge... This is, this is a huge initiative. This is like, people are talking about it at the dinner table. It's a big deal back in the um, mid-1990s, I would say. So Watson basically doesn't like the way Craig's doing things. So, so let me just add one quick detail, Lily. So there's an issue here on what gets patented on a project like the human genome. Can you patent the genome? Right, so this this whole issue is coming up. The general counsel at NIH advises Venter that yes, we are going to be able to patent a lot of this emerging genetics field. So let's protect. He's a researcher for NIH, so he's intramural researcher at NIH. Let's protect NIH by by filing a lot of the patents ourselves. And the confrontation with Congress is where Watson attacks Venter for patenting you know, genome technologies. In other words, it's not gonna be available to the scientific world. It's not gonna be open-based. It's not gonna be in the commons. Even though Venter had, received, had been told by the general counsel's office in NIH that that's what he had to do. So that leads to this explosion of anger by Venter. Yeah. So from Is that Venter's, a fair summary? Definitely, yeah. Okay. From Venter's side of the story, he says, I didn't necessarily want to patent these genes. The NIH advised me to. It was their initiative. And Watson used it as a way to undermine me in front of the American public because he didn't want me to use my technology that I had come up with. So that's the sort of the backstory. Uh, Venter is in, insanely angry, and he and his wife uh, def defect from the NIH and form Solera with the help of venture capitalists, who later also anger Venter, and that explodes. Um, and they take with them 12 mem of their lab members from the NIH. Uh, so the team, and I think that Craig Venter really exemplifies a great, great group leader in that he seems able to identify talent in others. Uh, so they start out with the 12 from NIH, they have their island of Solera, and the team that they start to form, um, this is not including like the board of directors and such, which also seem to be pretty amazing people, but they recruit Hamilton, actually I think, well Hamilton Smith comes onto the scene and he's their premier molecular biologist. And he's a Nobel Prize winner. Did he? Okay. Yeah. At, that during the time period or after? Prior. Yeah, time. yeah. So I don't think any of, this is actually a question I'm going to pose to the class at the end of my presentation. I don't think anyone in this great group has won a Nobel Prize, uh, except like for this, previously Ham Smith. Right. Um, so Marshall Peterson is this computer geek because not only is Hamilton Smith literally coming up with the sequencing technology to do this, this is, a, this is like 30 billion base pairs of DNA. The most anyone has sequenced at this point is like C. elegans or like a worm, like tiny, tiny genome. So this is a huge deal. Um, they have to come up with new sequencing technologies, new ways to decode the sequence and new computing. So they literally build the third largest computer on the planet, I think. 
Um, the DOE has a larger computer, and there's someone somewhere else in the world, and they, they build this massive computing facility. And then um, bring on Gene Myers as this, this coder who's coming up with the algorithms to try to piece together all these little pieces of DNA and build a 30 billion base sequence. Um, so in the meantime, the public sector, uh, academia, the NIH, are becoming increasingly angry with Craig Venter saying that he's he's defecting to the private sector and he's going after the human genome for profit. Craig is saying, I don't, I'm not in this for profit. I'm in this because we need a human genome so that we can promote human, you know, molecular biology-based medicine. Um, in the meantime, he sequences the um, Drosophila genome and gives it, it's, he publishes it in science, um, gives fruit it to fly. Yeah, the, the fruit fly genome, which people have been trying to figure out what genes in fruit fly do for decades and decades and decades. And so there's this really cool part in the interview where he talks about this uh, community of fruit fly researchers who I think are kind of like the, the physics community. You know, they're pretty close knit. They have their conferences and they try to get together and, and decode the fruit fly, which they don't have the bases or the, the knowledge to do that yet. So they're doing it like gene by gene by gene over many years. Um, and Craig decodes the, the fruit fly genome and says, come to Solera. I have all of the information that you've been looking for for the past few decades, and you can have it. It's here. So a couple, he says um, maybe on the order of 100 or so fruit fly researchers come, and they're just like kids in a candy shop. They stay up all hours of the night and like making these breakthroughs that they've been, that they've been um, looking for for decades. So that's pretty fun, pretty cool. Uh, so, fruit fly sequenced, um, NIH, you would probably know more about the, the interplay between Francis Collins and Venter, because that, I don't, I, I'm not, it's a little fuzzy for me. I can never figure out if they're working together or against each other, but eventually what happens in 2001, the NIH and the public like academia, so people from different universities come together and publish the human genome in the journal Nature, and like two days later, Solera announces the, same day. Oh, it is the same day. Yeah. Comes out in oh. Science. So this is was that planned? Yes. Yeah. So there had to be. I mean, it's a fascinating story, right? And there's rich oh. MIT history, which MIT was on the side of NIH, just so you know. So, um, Venter, through you know a research model that was extremely focused on getting this project done, right? Everything was to be organized for the project. NIH is on a research model that could be described as, let's let a thousand flowers bloom. We'll have a lot of R01 researchers out there, you know, eventually that will turn into the Human Genome Project. Someone made the analogy to that research model as, okay, if you put a whole lot of monkeys into a room and give them typewriters, eventually we'll get Shakespeare, right? That was, it's obviously exa exaggeration here, but Venter with this very focused research project and these computer scientists, and Venter himself becomes a master of the computers that he's working on building and, and EST technology is from that versus a much more decentralized research operation. So slowly, NIH realizes it's going to lose the race unless it gets its act together. So um, they begin to focus on you know, getting rid of the thousand flowers, let's get down to a small number of focused research centers. And it's, um, you know, it's a race really between, um, who's the Broad Institute head? What's his name? Oh, how can I forget? Lander. Eric Lander, yeah, of course, sorry, excuse me. So Eric, Eric's a mathematician, he's not a life scientist, right? And he becomes the leader of the hum, Human Genome Project for NIH. 
Collins is heading it, but Eric is the one who's carrying out the computational parts of it, right? And they do it in cooperation with the Department of Energy supercomputer labs, because they need their own supercomputing capability. Ventures built his, NIH uses DOE. So this race is ongoing. The NIH crowd is attacking Venter constantly for essentially trying to profit from patenting the genome. That's the complaint, that he's going to take this critical scientific advance, critical to the future of medicine, and take it out of circulation and access to science and patent it and prevent anybody from using it. That's the case being made against him. It's, it's, it's pretty far in reality from what the truth is, but that's the case being made. And Eric and the NIH team are gradually, they are using some of Venter's technology. They're originating certainly many of their own. They're within range. So at that point, a negotiated truth is arranged so that nobody gets embarrassed here, right? And the real worry was that NIH would lose the race, right? So eventually, Venter has prevailed on to declare a tie, and each side will publish in the two major scientific publications their version of the genome. And that's, in fact, what occurs. It's, go ahead. Uh, two points I want to make. One is that in this interview, Venter says that he finds out that Francis Collins, the head of the NIH, has, not, has budgeted less than half of what it's going to take at their current rate to complete the human genome. So in his mind, Collins has no intention of really completing it. Um, and they can't, as the way things stood. Um, the other point I wanted to make is that the NIA, like, Venter's enemies and adversaries keep bombarding him in the public by saying he's going to profit off the human genome. And there is a little, there's a, actually a lot of friction between <coughs> Venter and his venture capitalists because he wants to publish, 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 publish the findings that they're making so that other people can utilize them. And the venture capitalists keep saying, no, we don't want, you can't do that. You can't do that. It's private. We, we want to patent, et cetera. So there's that friction going on. So yes, eventually published at the same time. Um, Solera actually, uh, Venter is both quits and is fired from Solera at the same time. <laughs> and Which one came first? <laughs> In Venter's mind, he was about to quit anyway. Um, but yeah, he was basically asked to leave on a Monday morning. It's true the Steve Jobs of biology. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, they, there are a lot of parallels. Even the hippie phase. <laughs> but, but Martin, he's, he's different, right? He creates this group originally at his NIH lab. It's basically still with him, yeah, right? I want to follow up. Right. There this is not in. Jobs' abrasiveness, right, and screaming. This is somebody who is really, he's, he's a pretty charismatic figure. I've spent a little time with him. Um, and, you know, he is able to keep an re absolutely remarkable team together for a remarkably long period of time. Um, so it's a different personal atmosphere, a different kind of leadership style. But, you know, remember what it must have been like. I mean, he comes back from, you know, the Vietnam War full of, you know, Navy and Marine Corps tattoos, right? He's you know, a veteran of this, you know, ghastly war, and he's been, he's seen some of the worst outcomes running a whole hospital wing virtually on his own in Da Nang, and sees, you know, death and loss of life and trying to save life firsthand in a very personal kind of way. He's completely different than the kind of culture of NIH. You know, he's up from a working class military family, and it's just a different world that he's been exposed to. And he doesn't get along with this kind of, you know, established liberal community of scientists at NIH. So that's part of what's going on here, I think, Lily. Yeah, I think it's just, he's just a really different character. What's always pushing him at the NIH is, and through the, throughout the Human Genome Project, is decode the human genome so we don't see the situation or the things that he saw in the hospital at Donang. He doesn't, he thinks that modern medicine should eradicate those sorts of injuries and re, his vision is synthetic biology. We regrow, we grow everything synthetically. We grow human limbs, we, you know. He's very forward thinking as far as uh, the medical uses of knowing genetics. I uh, just question like, so what exactly were, were they trying to patent on, on either side? Was it 
lots of things. Um, so I think that one worry was that his invention, his Craig's um, method of EST would be patented itself, and it's a, an extremely, it was, for well, some areas of biology still use it, not my particular field, but a lot of areas in biology still use it. Um, and if it were patented, they wouldn't be able to, obviously. So it's, an, it's a widely applicable technique, um, and there was, there was worry that he would try to patent EST, or there might have, I think there was a patent in, and the NIH pulled it or something like that with so much negative uh, press. There were a couple of other things up for patent, maybe, but I don't know the specifics. Why don't we get into some questions? Yeah. Okay. Oh, hey, but I wanted to slides? let you know. Oh, oh yes. Okay. What does he do? So Solera, Solera goes boom um, with the dot com bubbles, like worth fifteen billion dollars, and in it, like the stock goes from five hundred bucks to six dollars. Um, at that point, Craig had already left. One of the reasons that the stock dropped so drastically was because people found out that Craig left. So now, well, not now, but then he decides, well, I'm going to do my own science, and I'm going to sequence the entire ocean. I'm done with the human genome. Now I'm going to go to the ocean. So he gets on this 100-foot yacht, the Sorcerer 2, and a couple of people um, I, I taught with a, with a woman who's a professor at USC who was on some of the Sorcerer uh, legs of the journey, and then her husband, John Heidelberg, is on. He was on my thesis committee, so he's the third author on this paper. Um, and they have lots of fun Craig stories as well. Um, and one of the, I think one of the themes throughout the great groups is that there are a lot of partiers. Like if they're not doing really crazy good science, yeah. they're partying. <laughs> so yeah. they, they dock and they just have a huge party. So then he finishes sailing around the world a couple of times and sequencing all the bacteria in the ocean and sets up the JCVI, which is located in La Jolla, right next to his alma mater, UCSD. Um, so that's a picture of Craig from a few years ago. Um, so to conclude, a few choice quotes from Craig. Um, I've gotten some pretty nice awards, and I'm having trouble <laughs> finding places to put them all. <laughs> and then one that's more pertinent to this class is, uh, the environment has fallen to the wayside in politics. And lastly, oh, I wanted to go over Venter's thoughts on innovation, but that's not we're getting close on time, so that's not really necessary. These are better. <laughs> How about some questions? <laughs> OK. Um, so show of, I wanted to see in the class by a show of hands, who thinks that Venter or, or maybe a couple of people within his group, I mean, they decoded the human genome, which was just the amount of new technologies that they came up with, both in computing and molecular biology, in order to do that are astounding. So who in here would say like he should be a Nobel Prize winner for people in his group? I'm sure there's got to be some other equivalent biology-centered award, right? That's uh, he's saying his own award, and then... Yeah, right. Well, he's got a lot of them. He's in this I mean, but instead of giving out your own award... If there's like a Watson and Crick award and he wins it, I'm like, hell, there's... <laughs> that, that won't uh, happen. Crick <laughs> was like so critical on him is like... Watson. Oh, Watson is yeah, like... Sorry. When they started, uh, a lot of their stuff was based off of Schrodinger's What is Life. That's how they come up with the DNA, because it was, it was mentioned. And they were seen as like nobodies up to that point. Molly, can I ask a really simple semantic question? Why do they call it decoding and not encoding the human genome? Mm, I think it would be called decoding because You're only reading it. what this looks like when you actually read the bases is fluorescent dye. So you have to read, you have to decode the, the fluorescent signature in order to get the base pairs. So it's not about, it's about more so evaluating the results than it is about sort of Expressing the results. Okay. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I don't think that's what cool like you inject DNA into like a like a bacteria and it changed the way it was. And it changed the way it was. I was oh. one thing about this effort here, and I mean. You have to get a sense of how transformational this seemed in the 1990s because it was really quite amazing, but. This was one of the great scientific competitions of all time, right? This incredible race to do the, to decode the genome. And um, this is being, you know, this is a major news story, right? And Francis Collins has a Harley motorcycle and sings in a blues band. And, you know, he has his own, you know, fest. He still rides his motorcycle into work at NIH. 
Um, Venter is a yachtsman who buys these wild, incredibly dangerous, you know, sailboats and loves the, the kind of wild adventure of, you know, being in a tempestuous sea close to the wind and near capsized danger uh, with these, you know, monster sailboats. So both of them have their kind of wild side here. There's no question about it. Um, but this competition captures the public imagination. And it's a very important race because the race forces incredible speed in the project. So what had I probably been originally viewed as a 40-year project gets you know, knocked down to well less than a decade by the time these characters you know, kind of complete the race and agree to a truce by publishing on the same day. Um, and in turn, I was working on in the Senate, you know, while all this is all going on, and you know, the public was getting a sense, gee, we really are getting fairly close to some obviously fundamental answers here. And when two U.S. senators, Senator Specter and Senator Harkin from Pennsylvania and, and Iowa, respectively, who were chair and ranking on the appropriations subcommittee that handles NIH, they actually there's a in the Clinton years, because the IT revolution is creating a lot of extra tax revenue, we're balancing the budget. So there's revenue, on one of those rare moments, there's revenue in the federal government. Specter and Harkin go down and take the revenue. And that's what doubles NIH. And nobody says they're wrong because of the excitement that this race to get to the genome is created and what its, what its scientific possibilities are. So. Sure, there's a whole political effort to radically increase NIH funding, but the enabler here is the public excitement around the genome race and what its possibilities might be to accomplish. So this has enduring kind of lasting effects that spill over in many kind of ways into the, into the life science arena. Next question, how about, you wanna pose a couple of questions and we'll, then we'll wrap things up. Um, yeah, one of the things I was thinking about while, while reading this and the other readings in the class is that Venter uh, seems to form and dissolve and reform multiple great groups throughout his lifetime, like from the 80s to present day. Um, and in thinking about other great but groups... But he's only changing the formal structure. The team really follows him from one organizational model to another. That's true. So do we think that most great group leaders have... A great one great group and they that's their like their opus they don't go on and they have one mission when you say group do you mean like a following oh, no, they all or a team, team. <laughs> team. Yeah. one team I mean, yeah i mean i would disagree well just to kind of give like it was like apple because there is the mac team that was a very unique so i'd say certain products or if it's a one particular problem you have a group um and then you can choose to decay the group after um, yeah, Apple is remarkable for its ability to go from major one ones. major technology launch to another in sequence. It's really it's hard, yeah. very hard and very difficult. And interestingly, it hasn't happened since Jobs died. That we know of. That we know of yet. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like they've at least some information about that, seeing as how um, the hype around Apple's kind of starting to die down. There's a, there's a model in industry. I mean, how does a big company innovate? It's a terribly difficult problem, right? They're the suits, they're the bureaucracy. Lockheed is kind of noted as the experimenter here. They, they set up something called the Skunk Works as a completely side, separate organization on a protected island with a bridge back to the Lockheed management. And they do remarkable advances in, in aeronautics and aerospace. So they do the they do the U-2, they do the SR-71 Blackbird, which many people to this day think is the most remarkable plane ever built. But then a whole sequence of other aircraft, and they do stealth, right? They're the implementers of a lot of the stealth technology. Um, so that's an example of how a corporation is able to create an entity that can move through a series of great groups and keep innovating. That's kind of held up as a kind of iconic model. So it is possible. So when you're, the small companies that you all set up become major corporations, you know, read, read about Skunk Works because that'll be your clue to continue to survival. Uh, Ray Stata uh, did something interesting like that where his company, they wouldn't fund. That's analog devices just yeah. up the street. They wouldn't fund looking to digital technologies. 
Um, and so what he had to do is he personally put in his own money to make a new company that the old company could now buy back. So he had to go get over it that way. It's so interesting. Lily, how about a closing thought for us about this amazing crowd? <sighs> Let's see. I think that Craig is right when he says you have to take risks. You have to take risks or else you're not going to do anything worth writing about. And that's a great way to close.